March 27th, 1977. KLM Flight 4805 departs Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam with three pilots. Captain Jakob Feldheische van Santa, First Officer Klaas Meurs, and Flight Engineer Willem Schroeder, 14 cabin crew members, and 235 passengers. While en route to their destination of Gran Canaria Airport, there are reports of a terrorist attack and they are forced to divert to Los Rodeos Airport, nowadays known as Tenerife North. A warning for a possible second bomb meant that Gran Canaria remained shut, which led to more and more aircraft arriving at Los Rodeos. The airport quickly filled up, forcing further arriving aircraft to park on the main taxiway. I'm sure you could guess that this would make the taxiway useless for taxiing, which will become very relevant in a few minutes. Among the aircraft who have also diverted here is Pan Am Flight 1736, which was on a flight from Los Angeles to Gran Canaria, with a stop at New York. On board are Captain Victor Grubbs, First Officer Robert Bragg, and Flight Engineer George Warns, 13 coming crew members, and 380 passengers. Eventually Gran Canaria Airport reopened, and so aircraft began preparing for departure. During this time, the KLM 747 was refueling, and had passengers waiting in the main terminal. Meanwhile, the Pan Am 747 aircraft was fully prepared to depart, and had everyone on board. But they couldn't move from their position, literally. The KLM 747 was actually blocking Pan Am's access to the runway, which meant they had no choice but to wait for the KLM aircraft to finish refueling. Once finished, the KLM 747 aircraft was first to depart, and were instructed to taxi down runway 12 and make a 180 degree turn to line up onto runway 30. This procedure is known as backtracking, and is common in airports without a taxiway for the runway. It's important to mention that the weather at Los Rodeos was not the best. In fact, due to the elevation of the airfield at 2,000 feet, the airport is greatly susceptible to poor weather and would commonly have dense clouds spreading across the runway. The idea was for the Pan Am 747 to follow the KLM 747 onto the runway, and exit via taxiway Charlie 3, and then use the parallel taxiway to taxi to the runway. Unfortunately, this plan did not match the reality. As the Pan Am pilots entered the runway, the visibility turned from 500 meters to 100 meters. As they taxied down the runway, they were first unsure as to whether the controller had said Charlie 1, or Charlie 3, and were then struggling to identify the exit through the thick and dense fog. At this stage, neither of the jumbo jets can see each other, and the air traffic controller had no idea of the series of events that were about to unfold. The small airport was not even equipped with a ground radar, and therefore completely relied on pilot reports during these low visibility operations. As the KLM aircraft lined up, the captain did not hesitate to apply power for takeoff. The first officer noticed this, and reminded him that a clearance was never issued. They stopped the aircraft and asked for a clearance. The controller replied back with flight instructions once the aircraft was in the air, but never actually gave an explicit clearance. The first officer replied back with the clearance and added, we are now at takeoff, to which the captain hastily interrupted and told the first officer, let's go. The air traffic controller replied saying, okay, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. Due to interference, this radio communication became inaudible to the KLM crew. However, upon hearing the conversation, the Pan Am crew tried to alert everyone about their presence on the runway by transmitting, we're still taxiing down the runway, Clipper 1736. To make matters worse, this communication was also blocked due to interference. As the KLM 747 begins rolling, the controller asks the Pan Am crew to call when they have cleared the runway. The flight engineer on the KLM 747 hears this and raises the alarm with the captain. The captain disregards this concern and continues with the takeoff. Seconds from collision, the Pan Am aircraft identifies the 747 through the fog and applies maximum power, attempting to get off the runway as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, the KLM aircraft attempts to perform an early rotation, causing a tail strike for a distance of 20 meters and only just gets into the air. The aircraft nose clears the Pan Am aircraft but the right engine slam onto the forward part of the fuselage, just behind the cockpit. The main gear hits the center of the fuselage, while the left engines destroy the empennage. The KLM aircraft manages to take off for a moment, but it becomes completely unflyable and crashes 150 meters later, 
sliding down 300 meters of runway. The aircraft, filled to the brim with fuel, almost instantly ignites. This crash became the single worst air accident in the history of aviation. All 248 passengers and crew in the KLM aircraft and 335 passengers in the Pan Am aircraft perish. 61 people on the Pan Am aircraft, including the flight crew, managed to survive, escaping through the left wing of the aircraft and openings on the fuselage. The visibility from the tower was very poor, so the air traffic controller had no idea of what had just happened and could only hear two explosions, one after the other. It was only after another aircraft reported fire that the tower alarmed the fire and rescue team. Due to the thick and dense fog, the rescue team was completely unaware that two aircraft were involved and only attended the blaze from the KLM 747, which was burning for almost 10 hours. Two days after the accident, a United States Air Force C-130 was dispatched to assist local medical staff in treating injured survivors. The airfield was shut to all aircraft and since the runway was closed, the C-130 Hercules landed on the airport's main taxiway. A massive investigation quickly gets underway involving the three nations, Spain, the Netherlands and the United States, as well as the two airlines, Pan Am and KLM. Like in all air accidents, there were a chain of events that led to this catastrophe. Firstly, the airport was catering for a huge number of aircraft. Having to park aircraft on the taxiway was no standard day at Los Rodeos, completely disrupting normal procedure there, adding extra pressure to the controller. There was also poor communication between the controller and the KLM pilots. Non-standard phraseology was used. Phrases such as we are now at takeoff were used by both parties which were easily misinterpreted. Radio interference made matters worse, as key information like Pan Am warning everyone that they were on the runway was never received by the KLM pilots. The weather was getting worse by the minute, and the decision to refuel by the KLM pilots meant that they would not only be departing in worse conditions, but would also be heavier, and so would require more runway length to get off the ground. Had they been lighter, they could have possibly gotten off the ground earlier, avoiding the collision. The weather may have been a large contributor to the Pan Am aircraft being unable to identify the runway exit. Had they identified the taxiway earlier, the accident would have been avoided. However, the Airline Pilot Association had also reported that taxiing out of Charlie 3 would have been very optimistic and close to impossible for the aircraft, as a 148 degree turn would have had to be made. The main cause of the crash was concluded to be the Kellen captain's decision to take off without a clearance and then disregarding the flight engineer after challenging him about the Pan Am aircraft being on the runway. This accident changed aviation and its effects can still be seen today. The word takeoff is no longer allowed to be used via radio, unless a takeoff clearance is explicitly being given. If pilots are ready for takeoff, they should transmit they are ready for departure. Within the cockpit, the disaster showed how a lack of teamwork between crew members can have a catastrophic effect. As a result, a greater emphasis was put on teamwork, decision making and communication skills for training in multi-crew environments. Inexperienced pilots were encouraged to raise their voice and challenge the captain. This eventually led to the foundation of CRM, or Crew Resource Management. In 1981, four years after the crash, United Airlines became the first airline to apply CRM in their training. In the following years, dozens of airlines began following in the footsteps of United. By the 90s, it became a global standard and has since played a critical role in aviation safety.